first speaker of the afternoon. This in the tradition of the conference, will not be announced, but he will be recognizable to you from his distinctive countenance. <laughs> Okay, so who are you again? Sorry, who are you? I don't know, but who's asking you? <laughs> so this is just artwork. Uh, before I start, uh, I uh, should tell you, this talk aims to be a triptych. That means three different subjects. It may end up being a diptych, but I hope it's not going to be one thing. I would like to thank Lenny and the other organizers for putting this together. It's been very exciting. Um, and I appreciate uh, uh, them asking me to talk about something. Now, I think Lenny was hoping I would talk about my 89 paper, which was on algorithmic complexity. And uh, it's an old paper. But it brought me to think about some things I've done back then. So I'm going to talk about things that are as old or older. Okay. Uh, last thing, and I have a feeling I don't need to say it. Questions are welcome. I invite them. But I reserve the right to suppress them. <laughs> <laughs> this was artwork. So let me tell you about the first thing that I'm going to talk about. Astrophysicists have, since Einstein's equations were uh, put together, especially Chandra Sekhar, were wondering about what happens when you have a system which is self-gravitating like a star. You know its equation of state. You know Einstein's equations. You would like to know what happens. The equation that has been uh, devised to solve the problem for systems which are static and spherically symmetric and this is just decoration. I don't expect you to understand it in detail. It's known as tolman oppenheimer volkov equation. And these three people are obviously responsible for it. What it says is that the <coughs> pressure should push back on the forces which makes things pull together. General relativity shows up, among other places, here. Uh, there is a for foreboding of, of, of short set variety. The equation is solved by respectable people starting in the middle of the star. There they say, I have such and such density. My mass is zero. I know that. And I have an equation of state. Or I posit an equation of state. I'm going to integrate it outwards. And I'm going to get, depending on what sort of things I put in, a neutron star, a white dwarf, or something else. Now, I'm going to do something not so respectable, is I'm going to imagine I have a big container, and I'm going to give temperature on its surface, given by temperature of the black hole. And I'm going to assume that the total mass on the inside is big enough that there has to be a black hole on the inside. And I'm going to integrate it in. I'm going to assume an equation of state as well, of course. So let's see what happens. Uh, by the way, just to tell you about the other ingredients, uh, the pressure and density play a crucial role. Equation of state gives you a relation between pressure and density. I'm going to assume so-called polytropic equations of state, meaning pressure proportional to density. Um, gamma or n parameterize the equation of state. By the way, if you put n equal to 2, pressure is equal to density, which means that at that point, the speed of sound becomes equal to the speed of light. You don't want to go outside of these limits. Um, because I have polytropic equation of state, I also know the relation between density and specific entropy. And uh, the only thing that I need to put in there is alpha. Alpha is Stefan's constant. In case you forgot, 
queries. We're going to set everything equal to 1, including pi square and, and, and 60 squares, if you have this, the rest of the, of the okay? So now I, I just go and integrate. Okay? First thing that I'm going to compute, by the way, this can be done essentially analytically. Are you assuming a bit static? Yes. Spherically symmetric static configuration. Right? No time dependence. This can be done essentially uh, uh, analytically. We've done it with Don Page <laughs> about the same time, and uh, separately where at least I was too shy to publish it. Uh, but then we got together and worked up our courage and published. Uh, turned out, a uh, dozen or so years later, uh, Gerard Tote did the same calculation using very different variables, which you know, gives me confidence that what we've got wasn't off. And uh, he got essentially the same uh, uh, conclusions. Um, he didn't know about our work. I think it was courtesy of, 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 of Rob Myers, if I'm correct. Was it? I had no idea. Yeah, no idea. Anyway, version number one posted on the, on the archive uh, just does it. Version number two says, well, they've done it. I'm going to do special cases more carefully. And he does it more carefully. And uh, you know, post papers look at things different ways in our sheet. Sorry, what's going on with that second equality at the bottom? It looks like they're selling to um, Which one? the bottom line, second equality. It looks like they're selling two numbers equal to each other. <laughs> 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 what's got H and what's got H bar? Two of them. Oh, H bar. Okay, yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> blind like uh, uh, That makes more sense. <laughs> I told you I'm going to set everything to one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You, so, you can set the equal if they are equal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, what's the message I take from the first slide? That there is an equation which is trusted by everybody who trusts general relativity and thermodynamics. <coughs> and let's see where it goes. Right? And I'm going to start integrating it at a far distance, much bigger than presumed size of the black hole, and go inwards. And just want to see what happens. And here's, uh, well, some people would think it's a little bit odd to use the thing to have a time independent static solution if you had a black hole there. I'm going to put the black hole in a box, or I'm going to put the black hole in a fancy box, uh, ABS, and I think I'm going to be in the region near the horizon where I'm interested in, I'm going to be fine. You're not going to go into the black hole. Let's see what equation takes you. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, letting the I'm letting the equation take me by the hand and guide me. And the interesting thing is, this is what happens. Right? So I start about uh, three short radii somewhere here. Um, density is, uh, uh, is, is initially more or less constant. But it, would, it would be. You're far from the black hole. Then you are needing the horizon, density increases. Then it spikes up. It spikes up right where the Schwarzschild horizon should be. But then it passes the place where Schwarzschild horizon was supposed to be. At this point, regardless of the mass of the black hole, the density becomes Planck density. Temperature hits Planck temperature. I can change a lot of things, including the number of species of radiation. Uh, this will happen. This is, by the way, for plot for the for the equation of state of photons. So n is, I think, equal to four, right? But we can solve it for other values of n, and we get the same sort of behavior. Uh, specific functional dependence here differs, uh, and as I said, this can be solved analytically. Piecewise, and then solutions can be sold together. And we took different pieces than than talked, and uh, when we saw them together, it looks uh, similar. Now, what happens in the middle? Density drops. Why does it drop? Turns out, smack in the middle, there is a negative point mass. Basically, you integrate until r is zero plus, 
and you see that the total mass you've got at that point is negative, so you must have something on the inside which makes up for the difference so that from the outside you see the mass of the black hole. That mass of that uh, negative singularity, negative mass singularity, first of all, it's a negative mass singularity. It's in some sense benign. Particles are repelled by it. And the mass of the negative mass singularity is large. Scales like mass of the black hole power three, but it turns out that most of that huge mass doesn't have to do with the mass, but with the redshift. Right? So the photons here with black hole temperature photons, here they are blue shifted to blank, blank, blank temperature. Uh, if you were to somehow bring out that central singularity to the outside, it will turn out its mass would actually decrease with the mass of the black hole. But you need it there. I mean, that's Chandrasekhar theory. If you have something like that, this sort of configuration, you are going to have a singularity. Now, once you have this, the interesting question is, what's the entropy of that configuration? So let's calculate. And you can add solutions. So we've done the calculation. And you do it the old-fashioned way. And the entropy turns out to be related uh, to the kind of polytropic index that you've adopted. Right? So let me give it to you in terms that are simple. The entropy starting from 2m to 0 is proportional to the entropy of the black hole. When n is equal 4, so photon gas, the entropy is too large. It's 8 fifths of the entropy of the black hole. In order to make it equal to the entropy of the black hole, you can set n equal to 2. n equal to 2 is a moment where your velocity of sound equals to the velocity of light. So it's the stiffest imaginable equation of state. I asked this earlier, but this is not, it's a static configuration. Yes, yes. There's no event horizon. There's no event horizon. So I wouldn't make that in the collapse of the star, for example. No. I quite don't know, you know, what would happen, right? I mean, but, you know, I'm going well, down. We do, I mean, we know many situations yes. where you form a trapped surface, and then you have to have an event horizon. Well, I don't know what the inside of the black hole looks like, apart from, you know, but what, you what I think you know. It violates your covariant entropy bound. It's violating the covariant entropy bound because it uh, has negative mass things. Uh, yes. It's only legal things. <laughs> 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 but I mean, uh, I, one can also wonder whether the equation of state I've put in there is a whole story. Right? It's very clear that it's vacuum polarization effect, etc. The complaint effect, is the negative mass singularity. Sorry? The complaint is the negative mass singularity. Which uh, goes like, it's. I'm not saying, I don't have complaints about it. I'm telling you what happens if I integrate the equation, right? But the negative mass singularity gets smaller as the mass of the black hole gets larger. In uh, if you if you take into account blue shift, okay? Boundary conditions are part of uh, dealing with equations, right? Of so course. You're putting a funny boundary condition and then getting results. Well, I think they are funny, but not uninteresting, right? I. I didn't want to get a star. I wanted to see what happens if I take equilibrium and try to follow it to the inside. And well, I, I guess I could <coughs> point out, I was somewhat reluctant to publish this, that, that uh, the, the, wavelength, the wavelength is not short compared to the curvature scale. So you wouldn't, the, the, the thermal wavelength is not short, so you wouldn't really expect it to be an isotropic pressure with P equals a third. Third row. I mean, then, that's that's part. There would be polarization effects, and one could worry about you know yeah, yeah, so the vacuum on the way and and. Uh, I mean that's why. I mean, you know, if you did that normally, you just get a black hole with a tiny perturbation from the yeah. jet energy tensor of the radiation. So this. That's right. So it's not hard to. Right. Yeah. So is the point that the uh, negative mass singularity is repulsive, so keeping everything else from collapsing? Yes. No. Okay. Yeah. 
but it doesn't, I mean, the, the point, the other point is that it's, that it is enough for it to be tiny. So, for example, one can imagine that there are quantum effects which do that job uh, since we know they're going to, you know, affect the physics around the horizon already. Right? I'm confused, but I mean, we already know that there are lots of examples of physical processes where you do not form a black hole. Yes. This looks well, from the outside like a black hole, right? It's going to evaporate exceedingly slowly if I take out uh, this this uh, mirror, right? So uh, from the outside, it's going to be distinguishable. Now, the reason I thought it's interesting in the context uh, of this meeting is, you know, it's in some sense an equilibrium firewall which forms here, right? It's different firewall in motivation than the AMPS firewall, but firewall it is. It's hot. Last questions about the first part of the triptych, or I move on. Is this on the edge of violating some energy condition? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, you know, you are on the edge when V uh, of sound is equal to V of light, almost, right? So, you it's know, it's faster than... But it's almost the dominant energy condition. It's on the edge of the dominant. E equals rho will be the dominant. E yeah. So N equals 2 is the dominant. Okay, second part of the trip. I changed subject completely. Now I'm going to talk more. <laughs> for about uh, 15 minutes about the coherence scale in the second part. This explains, or maybe it will explain eventually, the artworks of the scene. That's not the whole thing. Uh, the old paper was published uh, what, 23 years ago, <laughs> but there's lots of stuff that happened since. The reason I think it's interesting in this context is uh, that it gives one a slightly different view of what happens uh, when the second law uh, acts on quantum systems. My uh, uh, conviction is that the coherence plays a role, and I'll try to convince you why. Let me start with a brief introduction to decoherence. Um, decoherence happens when a system is interacting with the environment. Uh, if you start a system in some arbitrary quantum state, it will entangle with the environment. This is Schrodinger evolution. And then entangled state, well, is entangled. If you are interested in the system alone, you can calculate its density matrix. And its density matrix is obtained by tracing over the environment. Now, you will discover that in many cases, when you fix the interaction, uh, nature of the interaction between the system and the environment, this density matrix is diagonal in the same set of states. So these sets of states, these states that appear habitually on the uh, uh, diagonal density matrix are preferred. If you started in one of them, nothing would have happened. I call these pointer states, uh, because they are the states of a pointer of the apparatus, they would have that property. But uh, and the and environment induced super selection or ein selection for short is a process which selects. The Hamiltonian of interaction between the system and the environment plays a leading role in, uh, in, in selecting uh, these three states. Um, in particular, if there is a set of states which commutes with this interaction Hamiltonian, and there is no Hamiltonian of the system to speak of, these states will be unselected. As a state will, will entangle. Right? So the state which entangle least are the ones which are preferred. I you know, do operations, I accept Bohr's rule, something I could have derived and kept things thought about, but uh, I will not go in, 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 in that more uh, foundation direction. Let me give you an example. And it's a very simple one. Uh, reduction of the wave bucket in quantum gradient motion. I consider a harmonic oscillator coupled to the environment. Coupling is linear, and it's diagonal in the observable x position of the harmonic oscillator. So you know, this ball rolls, and there is a field which is the environment. I can obtain effective equations of motion for just the harmonic oscillator by solving the whole thing. The linear system, 
and tracing out the environment. I have an equation written for the density matrix in position, position, representation. First bit is familiar for my one equation. Second bit turns out corresponds to relaxation and damping. The third bit is of interest, special interest to us. Why? Let's take a mathematical classical limit. Something one shouldn't do. Let h bar go to zero. Not quite to zero. Let h bar be very small. It's very clear that because h bar appears in a square in here, this term is going to dominate. So approximately, I'm going to be solving equation which says this is equal to this. This means that the solution can be written down like that. When I end on the diagonal in position, x equal to x prime, nothing happens to the density matrix. When I am away from the diagonal, density matrix gets suppressed. To see it in action, let's take a look at some uh, an example which would appear, for example, in, in the double slit experiment. I have a superposition of a Gaussian on the left and a Gaussian on the right. A density matrix which describes this, when the superposition is coherent, is here. These are things on the diagonal. These are, this recognizes that there is coherence. If I hit it with that equation, on the diagonal nothing happens, away from the diagonal things shrink. So coherence gets lost. How quickly? You could say I'm going to isolate my system extremely well, and uh, coherence will be preserved. Well, you can relate the rate of relaxation, which is rate at which energy and momentum are lost, to the rate at which coherence is suppressed. A simple proportionality relation. The coherence rate is equal to the rate at which you lose uh, energy, but multiplied by a factor. This factor is the non-locality. Here is the distance between the two peaks, expressed in units of thermal de Broglie wavelengths. I have assumed, by the way, thermal environment conditions or, or, or conclusions will hold even without the assumption, although, of course, numbers, time dependences, etc. will change. And thermal de Broglie wave is thermal de Broglie wave. I mean, that's, you know what it is. So, suppose I'm really able to isolate my system extremely well. I want to be able to have, uh, uh, you know, isolation on a, on, a, on a very long time scale, Hubble time. Right? Just for the, for the purpose of the argument. 10 to the 17 seconds. And I'm going to take my system to be macroscopic, but not huge. One gram, one centimeter room temperature. This factor is 10 to the 40. So if you are able to isolate the system on a time scale, on a Hubble time scale, you're going to lose coherence on a time scale of 10 to the minus 23 seconds. It's very hard competition. And when you have time scales like this, you should check your cutoffs and so on, and you may end up losing a couple of orders of magnitude here or there, but the conclusion will stand. Loss of information, which is the essence of decoherence, is much, much faster than loss of, of energy. Now, I want to move to chaos, and I've got 15 minutes. I'm going to have 15. Okay. And so I'm going to do the same thing but in the phase space. So decoherence and phase space, uh, Wigner representation. Wigner distribution is defined by this sort of uh, halfway Fourier transform of a density matrix. If you know it, you ignore it. If you don't know it, you won't learn it from this transparency. <laughs> I assume you, you know enough to, to get the field. Let me suppose, uh, so, a Gaussian Wigner distribution corresponds to a Gaussian in the phase space. 
if I have a superposition of two stationary peaks in phase space, so x minus delta x, x plus delta x, then there is a superposition term which appears halfway in between. There's an oscillation. And here it is. I have two Gaussian peaks, and I have an interference term. The wavelength in this interference term uh, decreases as I increase the separation between these. Here's the same thing, but in a different direction. Here's a separation of the two peaks as a momentum, uh, and uh, uh, this is position. Right? So, uh, the direction of this interference pattern depends on how I space the piece. Now remember, my interaction Hamiltonian was proportional to x. So position is going to be the observable, which is going to be preferably uh, recorded and uh, by the environment. So now, for a harmonic oscillator, I can write uh, an equation, which I get by linear transforming the master equation I had before. Uh, the interesting thing is that the decoherence term, which was a focus of attention, turns out to Wigner transform into diffusion momentum. You can estimate decoherence naivete again, before I did it by looking at how quickly the off diagonal terms are suppressed. Now I'm going to look at how quickly this oscillation is erased. Right? If there is diffusion in momentum, these positive and negative peaks are going to flow into each other. The result is the same. I mean, the answer cannot be current on, on the representation. And for comparison here, uh, it is a picture of what happens when you start with a superposition of two positions and superpositions of two momentum. Very quickly, superpositions of two positions loses its interference. These are not evenly spaced. Both. Momentum interference stays up. Interaction with the environment can't tell different momenta. Only when the two peaks move away from each other because of rotation, harmonic oscillator, you end up eradicating that superposition. Okay. Chaotic dynamics. I'm going to marry chaotic dynamics with decoherence. So, the basic idea is, and I'm starting with classical phase space. So, I have chaotic evolution, which means a patch in the phase space is going to be deformed. Roughly speaking, each E folding. I'm going to stretch this thing and shrink this. I have to do one and the other because I have to do things consistent with the Lewis theorem. Phase space volume <coughs> has to stay the same. So after some time, I have a tiny uh, dimension in this direction and a very extended direction in this direction. If the system is finite, this thing is going to start folding. It's going to be a spaghetti. I, I'm not, this is not in this picture, but it's going to be. What do I do now? Well, I write a von Neumann, uh, I write a, 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 an equation corresponding to the von Neumann bracket with decoherence. Let me start just with von Neumann bracket. If you express the evolution in terms of the bigger function, you get so-called Moyer bracket. You can expand it in powers of h bar. The first term is Poisson bracket. Great, we've got classical dynamics. Other terms are higher powers of h bar, even powers of h bar. I mean, you should ignore it, right? I mean, the h bar is small. Well, not so fast. The problem with ignoring them is that you have here terms which depend on derivatives of position and worse than that on derivatives of momentum. You can imagine what happens to the derivatives of momentum if they go this direction. If this thing shrinks exponentially, 
they blow up exponentially. The bottom line is that after a time, which is logarithmic, in some measure of the nonlinearities of the system and spread in momentum, you are going to have loss of correspondence between quantum and classical. Now, you could say, well, edge bar is small, don't worry about it. Shouldn't happen to microscopic systems. My favorite example, actually, is the moon of Saturn. It's Hyron. Okay, Hyron moves on an orbit which is elliptical. The orbit is fine, but Hyron is shaped like a potato. So, in a tidal field of Saturn, it tumbles. The tumbling time is short enough that this T H bar comes out to be 20. So you have a really large Schrodinger cat potential in the solar system. Wait, now, this, is, this is a film that's not in an environment. We are getting there. You are always ahead. <laughs> so, back to the artwork. Okay? So here I have a chaotic system. It's one dimensional, and in one dimension you can have chaos only if you drag it. This started as a Gaussian somewhere in Facebook. If you were to use uh, Louville theorem modulo numerical errors, this would sum up to what it's supposed to. Now, I'm going to do the same thing, but using Schrodinger. You can recognize, by the way, color coding is like in geography. This is Mariana Trench. This is Mount Everest. Uh, you can see that there are things which are not different between these two, but there's all sorts of other stuff that's happening. Particularly, there is this small scale structure. How small, by the way, you can tell because this square has square footage of Planck constant. So this tiny structure is smaller than Planck. Now, this was without decoherence. Let me do it with decoherence. Right? So I, and I'm going to do a simple thing. I'm just going to throw in the dominant diffusion. So I have Moyle bracket, which means all of that mess, which ended up giving me small scale structure and so on. But also the diffusion. Quantum, classical, quantum decoherent. Mariana Trench is still there, but it got shallower. Most of the stuff is uh, yellow. Louville theorem would no longer hold. Now, the interesting lesson of that is that you can use this sort of discussion to get the rate of entropy production in systems like this. And I'm going to do that. And the argument is very simple. Remember this uh, uh, stretching uh, shape. As it keeps on getting stretched, initially, Its surface area and phase space is not going to change. Louisville theorem is going to win. However, at some point, decoherence is going to put stop to the validity of uh, Louisville theorem. Basically, there is a status quo between squishing and diffusion, which builds up when the thickness of this spaghetti is given by this. Lambdas are uh, Laponov exponents. D is a diffusion constant with carbon coefficients. So this is interesting because it says that you know for a while you will not be producing entropy because you are just deforming the initial thing without changing its surface area. But at some point 
you will keep on stretching it, but you can no longer compress it. You are stretching it exponentially, but your thickness is fixed. At this point, the volume is going to go up exponentially. Entropy is a log of the volume of the phase space. So therefore, at this point, entropy production rate is going to be given by the sum of positive Lyapunov exponents. So what you're saying, you can derive this without making an assumption of what you're Nothing. I mean, so coarse graining is in coupling to the environment, in yeah, decoherence. You're saying like, you don't have to invoke a coarse grain. I don't have to. Now, the we're also we're giving you the same formula. Yes. Now, the interesting thing is that the rate of entropy production is, uh, I think it's called Pogorov Pessin Sinai, some combination of names, completely classical. Sum of positive Lyapunov exponents. It does not depend on the rate of decoherence. And I think you understand now why. There's going to be the thickness, this limiting thickness that's going to happen at some point. But the stretching is going to continue and it's going to be given by the uh, uh, classical Lyapunov exponents. Uh, so, you know, this is sort of preamble to the diagrams that we've seen before. This is entropy production rate as a function of time. Initially, when I had a big block, not, you know, one uh, uh, plank uh, uh, scale, but bigger, I'm going to have a deformation without entropy production. So that at some point, decoherence is going to resist squishing. And you're going to hit constant entropy production rate. This has been seen in computer simulations um, by us, uh, by Juan Pablo Paz and other people. And so we know it happens. So I think I should wind down. OK. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, I'll go on until you Yeah, you have about five minutes. OK. So decoherence chaos in the second law. Uh, so basic conclusion is quantum dynamics plus decoherence gives you classical dynamics in the sense that it favors point-like patches that are small in phase space, but it also gives you irreversibility. When these patches are small enough to start being supported in their thickness by decoherence, you end up producing entropy. You end up producing entropy because you end up building up correlations between the system and the environment, and that entropy production uh, doesn't depend on the rate of decoherence. It depends only on the positive Lyapunov of exponents. You can derive, uh, and you get limited reversibility. You start with a big patch which is smooth, nothing's going to happen to it, to it for a while. You can run it backwards. I'm going to skip this because you are probably less interested in quantum classical correspondence. I'm going to simply emphasize this uh, dynamical second law. And uh, key thing independent of the strength of the coupling uh, to the environment. I put this in extra. So we did that in the olden days. There's a recent paper where we are reformulating foundations of, of, of uh, statistical physics without ensembles. It's possible in a quantum universe. Ensembles were uh, invented by the likes of Bohr and Maxwell, where the fundamental dynamics was Newtonian. And the state of a system had to move in the phase space. Equilibrium is not supposed to move. So you have to distribute the points in a phase space so that each of them can move separately, but the whole cloud stays put. If you have quantum system, you can get that because of entanglement, because of correlations with the path, the environment, whatever you call it. I think it's good time for me to stop. Thank you. Do you think if we lived in a classical world, classical life, you would be a second law of dynamics? I think there would be, but we'd be blaming ourselves for it. Yeah, we'd be blaming our, our vision. That's right. Yeah. And I think but in a quantum universe, it's fundamental. It's just mm -hmm. the way it is. It would be more subjective. Yes. 
does this, I mean, if, if you had something that has this, this chaos, could you estimate the, the, the time in which it becomes more unity by just taking the op off time and multiplying it by, by basically the log of the action? Does that, does that work pretty well for getting the time in which the... Local time. Well, the log of the action. I mean, I mean, you might say, okay, yeah. you know, so, I mean, basically, so, so you know, you would have three phases, right? The first phase is where you just deform a classical patch. Right. Second phase where you catch up to what the uh, Apunov exponents tell you, and then the third phase, uh, which Lenny uh, emphasizes, where entropy production would go down because you fill in the whole space. Right, so right. you know, that's there's a time scale to go to that. For, is yes. that basically sort of like something like the log of the action. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, I don't have it here, but yeah, yeah. We can, it's in the paper. So. Yeah. Just just to come back to Lenny's question, I mean, it seems like either in a quantum world or in a classical world, we could regard the second rule as either subjective or objective, depending on our point of view about you know, is the course grading. You know, or is the choice of basis? You know, you know, you know. Do we call that something objective? Right? I mean, I mean, it seems to me like like a matter of degree rather than of kind. So, I, you know, matters of degree yeah. and questions which have a philosophical flavor yeah. are, are are not to be argued. All right. Yeah, but but I mean, uh, just to argue it anyway. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Lenny said it very well. Yeah. You know, in a classical world, we'll be blaming ourselves for not being oh. able to. Uh, Here, yeah. we are not blaming ourselves, we are blaming the environment for sucking out the information and taking it out of our reach. And it's not something that's, that's you know, that's subjective. It's fairly clear that if a photon bounces over me and races yeah. that way, it's gone. I'm not going to be able to catch it. Because it's outside of our And there is much more to say and so on with that. All right, all right. None. <laughs> well, entropy was in both of them. All right, let's take what you can get.